Crazy. Well, hello there, all you wonderful fools. Big T here. How y'all doing? It's finally time to do the versus video I've been wanting to do for quite some time. In this episode, I'm pitting two of Nintendo 64's biggest juggernaut games against one another. Being that the N64 is my all-time favorite console, it's home to my all-time favorite games as well. And we're going to compare, contrast, and rate two of its best. And we're going to do it T-View style. What's T-View, you might ask? I don't blame you for not knowing. Way back when, I had a mind to regularly review games on my channel. After doing my first review for Super Mario 3D World, I soon realized the enormity of doing reviews in the professional way I chose to do so. And I won't do it any other way. It takes a lot of work and time that I don't usually have, but it's something that I want to get back to. So why not do it in grand fashion? The conclusions met in this video will be my own personal opinions as someone who loves these games, and I've played and beaten them both multiple times. So I have a thorough knowledge and respect for them both. So with that, let's get it started, foos. First up, we're going to take a look at the presentation for Super Mario 64. Super Mario 64 was the first game gamers saw for the Nintendo 64, and it blew our minds into macaroni chunks. From the 3D Mario stretchy face to the first time you walk into Peach's castle, our jaws were continuously on the floor. This was the first time gamers had seen anything like this, coming from a 98% 2D run left to right gaming industry to allowing full 3D range of movement and exploring. It was just simply amazing, but it wasn't an overly deep setup, mind you. The story begins with Mario being invited to the castle by Peach to eat a cake she baked for him. That's right, a powerful monarch that rules the kingdom took time out of her busy, important day to go in that kitchen and bake a cake for her man and shortly after get kidnapped by Bowser and need that man Mario to come save her yet again. <laughs> go ahead, misguided feminist. RAGE! But seriously, it could have been way more interesting with just some minor tweaks. What if instead, the invitation was a ruse designed by Bowser to lure Mario to the castle where he is initially trapped? Simple, but it would have been much more effective. Nonetheless, the setup of the castle as a hub world with multiple rooms and secrets is simply brilliant. Finding standard worlds behind star doors or stumbling upon secret levels in and around the castle was a transformative gaming experience. The levels were expertly crafted to not only encourage exploration, but to smartly train the lifelong 2D gamer in the more intricate mechanics of running around in a 3D world. This video review is being produced in the year 2017 for a game that came out in 1996, and therefore I'm going to judge it based on games that came out during its era, the mid to late 90s. Unlike IGN, who decided it makes sense to judge a 1995 era Super Nintendo game by today's standards. Yeah IGN, your review of Star Fox 2 was Omega stupid. Come on man, come on. Seriously. That said, the graphics in Super Mario 64 are fantastic. Nintendo brought Mario into the 3D realm seemingly with ease and great care. He looked like we imagined him to, and the worlds are vibrant and clean, making you want to search every possible nook and cranny. But even back in 1996, I occasionally felt a lingering emptiness, and for lack of a better term, a bit of soullessness. Honestly, many 3D games in that era somewhat had this issue, but overall, Super Mario 64 has a fantastic presentation. Banjo-Kazooie, on the other hand, is brimming with the style, pizzazz, and confidence that is occasionally lacking in Super Mario 64. Rare clearly benefited from Mario being the blueprint for their game. They were able to study what was right and what was wrong about Mario 64 and improve on each aspect. The game starts up with a Saturday morning cartoon intro with the bear and his friends dancing to a classic music number that included the sounds from a kazoo and banjo. The actual opening of the game itself has a classic Disney animation setup where the ugly witch Gruntilda desires beauty and plots to kidnap Banjo Bear's baby sister to put her into a machine which looks like something out of the Fly movie and turn her hideousness into hotness. And boy, she be looking good. <clears throat> Yeah. But like I said in the other videos, Rare always seemed to master the hardware they were working on, and the N64 was no exception. The worlds in Banjo-Kazooie are lush, vibrant, and brimming with personality. The character animations are brilliant, and the comical gibberish they emit is just charming. Super Mario 64's worlds are stark in design by contrast, and are more like mini obstacle courses than they are little worlds. Collecting the main items in Banjo-Kazooie's levels 
those shimmering golden jiggies, doesn't pull you out of the world the way collecting stars in Super Mario 64 does. It would seem that Super Mario Odyssey adopted the Banjo-Kazooie way of doing things. There's just so much more polish and personality in Banjo-Kazooie and I found it engaging. Just take a look at how much more elaborate the file save menu is in Banjo-Kazooie over Super Mario 64. This is just one of the many reasons Banjo Kazooie wins the presentation category handily. <laughs> Super Mario 64 is easily the purest platformer of the two. As I mentioned before, some worlds within the game feel like mini obstacle courses designed to test your skills at controlling Mario. Levels like Lethal Lava Land come to mind. Wow, kids, now that's alliteration. There are rarely, no pun intended, any levels in Banjo-Kazooie that are quite as perilous. Banjo-Kazooie also introduces the gameplay mechanic of transforming into different objects and animals. Another mechanic it seems Super Mario Odyssey has adopted, as I said before. Banjo-Kazooie is more of an action platformer really, and it doesn't really test your skill traversing the world as it does just entertaining you with the sights, sounds, and vistas to be seen. Honestly, its scattered mini-bosses barely ever caused any real challenge either, and were hardly memorable. The same could be said for Super Mario 64's mini-bosses as well, though. Other than the handed sand boss that surely went on to inspire Ungo Bungo from Zelda Ocarina of Time, or the sheer awesomeness of facing a 3D Bowser Koopa for the first time, there isn't really much to say for the big bads in either game. Although the hilarious trivia board and final battle with Gruntilda in Banjo-Kazooie is a pretty epic battle with a fantastic finish. Grabbing Koopa by the tail for the third time doesn't really match up to that. Even though it doesn't have the polish of Banjo-Kazooie, its gameplay and platforming is more streamlined, focused, and refined. <laughs> the music category is probably the first one I thought about when coming up with this episode of Versus. It was the one that I thought would be the hardest to judge. On the Banjo-Kazooie side, the score is done by the phenomenal composer Grant Kirkhope, who has an amazing resume from Killer Instinct to Perfect Dark, from Star Fox Adventures to Mario plus Rabbit's Kingdom Battle and Ukulele. He's a venerable master of his craft, and that is certainly on display in Banjo-Kazooie. The music tracks are lush, grandiose, and snappy, hitting a perfect tone and match for each level. And one of its best features is the dynamic music on display here. Basically, the track transitions in each world either with shifting instruments or tempo based on the area of the world you're in. It's simply brilliant. <laughs> On the other hand is the master composer Koji Kondo for Super Mario 64. And while the music setup may not be as grandiose and elaborate as Banjo-Kazooie's tracks, the music in Super Mario 64 is just beautiful, and they are simply way more memorable. I often find myself humming these tracks regularly even 20 years later. From the echoey interior castle music, to cool cool mountain, to the eerie ghost mansion, to the soothing Jolly Rogers Bay, it's all just captivating. I play and beat both of these games at least once a year since they've launched. It's kind of like a gamer tradition of mine, but Super Mario 64's music and sound is just way more molded into my mental audio files. From collecting stars, finding secrets, solving puzzle chimes, and Mario's own woohoos, wahas, and snoring while dreaming of mamma mia is just so cute and charming. Super Mario 64 wins the category of music and sound, but I do love the sound of getting jiggy with it. And here we are at Fun Factor, seemingly the oft-forgotten aspect by people reviewing games today. It's honestly the most important thing to me. Both of these games are fun as hell, packed with secrets and cool worlds to explore. These are two of my favorite experiences on the N64, and they are both in my top five games of all time for that console. Banjo-Kazooie, the action 3D platformer, and Super Mario 64, the legendary blueprint for the entire industry on how to do a game in 3D. 
a beautiful transition from the 2D Super Mario formula, a fantasy sandbox world of wonder. But in this case, I give a marginal edge to the fun factor in Banjo-Kazooie. The setup is just more engaging, and the worlds have more personality, as do the main characters Banjo and Kazooie. The combination of abilities between these two just offer much more gameplay variety, making it a slightly more enjoyable experience. So who has the better game? Is it the plump plucky plumber or the banjo playing bear and his rough feathered barb spitting bird? This was really tough, but I'm giving the nod to Banjo Kazooie. This is honestly an unfair contest in some ways as Super Mario 64 is basically the first game on the hardware and Banjo Kazooie benefited immensely by using it as a template to build from. Rare had the benefit of not only that, but more time with the hardware to pull off bigger worlds, better graphics, and more refined characters. So when comparing game versus game, Banjo Kazooie edges it out. Well there you have it. I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and please leave your feedback in the comments below. These are the types of videos I enjoy doing the most on my channel, but these videos are bigger productions with scripts and more elaborate editing. So they take a lot of time, and time that I just don't have much of these days. So I'm at a fork in the road with my channel. If it's going to continue, it has to be with the content I initially envisioned for it. More fun, creative things like this. For that, I'll need your support. I want this channel to truly be a show, as I initially envisioned it, encompassing scheduled programs of many different types. If you've been subscribed a while, you've seen my many different false starts. And what I mean by false starts is, sometimes I'll introduce a new show idea, do one or two episodes of that idea, and you'll never see another one because I just don't have the time to produce it. But I'm in a unique position. As a freelance video producer and editor, I have the freedom to set my own work schedule. But I do have financial obligations and goals to meet. With enough donations from supporters of my content, I can significantly scale back my workload and be able to have much more time to dedicate to this channel. And without having to worry about YouTube's algorithm nonsense. I initially had so many ambitions for this channel that I haven't met when I started roughly four years ago. I look around at other channels that have passed me up over the years and I can't lie, it bothers me. Because I know my creative video making skills are mostly unmatched, but I just don't have the time to really show that. If every one of my current subscribers gave just one dollar a month, I could basically be doing this full time. Oh wait, I just gave away my monthly income, didn't I? Oh well. So if you like the sound of this, please support the Mizzet Show on Patreon and be a part of turning this show into one of the best channels on YouTube. I have a follow-up video detailing all the cool show ideas I have planned, so make sure you watch that video, foos. Thanks to all my longtime supporters, and the new guys as well. I hope you keep supporting T. Continue to like and share my videos, and retweet them as well. And don't hesitate to follow your boy on Twitter. It's time to get real, and time to get on camera. Hmm. That's right, foos. Peace out.